Uh, very warm welcome to the Audit Risk and Scrutiny Committee. Very special warm welcome to the new members of, of the committee. Uh, it's good to see you here and present. So, uh, before I start, there'll be three items today for business. Uh, there's been a particular set of circumstances of what has happened, and we're aware of. I spoke to most of the members in the room, but obviously, hopefully, that'll you'll have a clear understanding because we were made aware of uh, what's happened since yesterday. So, because of because of that, we will be taking uh, sedent apologies. We will be taking declarations of interest, and we will be looking at the accounts to be signed off because procedurally we need to get the, have them done in September. So. Joanne, we'll not be going into asking you to do a presentation, but we will have questions for you in regards to that. In particular, Joanne's obviously our external auditor lead. Uh, Joanne, I think you're probably all aware of that. But we will look to uh, get a, another slot in the diary at some point over the, o over the short course of time, I would imagine, and look at the rest of the business. Uh, before we fi finish up, I will talk briefly about this uh, scrutiny reviews. So, Claire, you first. Thank you. 11 members present this morning. Two apologies from Councillor Karen Crullers and Councillor Stitt. Um, Councillor Heavy and Councillor Scobie not present. So it's how are Councillor Howie will be along shortly. And Councillor Scobie will just wait and I'm coming. Please, Scobie. Okay. Uh, declares of interest, anyone? anyone? Any declares of interest? There's none declared. So, uh, item. Number five, we'll go straight into uh, So that's a report by the External Auditor of 1819 Audit Report. And rather than, like I say, go into a presentation, we've all read the report, read it front to back, can't say back to front, numerous occasions. We'll go straight into, into questions. And uh, Malcolm, I see you've got your hand up. <laughs> Thank you, Chair. Yeah, so just as has become apparent, there has been a crude income. Uh, overstating the income position in relation to the to the trunk roads contract. Now, I wonder where we can find this mentioned in the accounts. And given that we now know the situation, that this income is not going to be available, um, how happy are we with the fact that these accounts present a true and fair view of the position? We'll take Paul to come in to start that, then we'll ask Joanne to, as external auditor to finish. Yes, thanks, Chair. Uh, in, in terms of, of that accrual, that was a 2017-18 year-end accrual. Uh, that, the whole issue is subject to an investigation at the moment, which will be reporting back to the Communities Committee in November. Uh, however, in terms of that over accrual, we corrected that in financial year 2018-19. Uh, we had made appropriate uh, provision for in bad debts for the partial impact of that and the other uh, the remaining impact was addressed at the Policy and Resources Committee when it reported out turn in June. So the 2018-19 accounts are correct. They don't continue that over accrual. Uh, but obviously that is a significant issue in the 2018-19 financial year, but it has been appropriately addressed. So the 2018-19 year-end accounts are now correct. Sure. Sorry, Malcolm. Uh, so, on, on that basis, is there a, a note in the accounts about this? Because I, I did try to find the information. Oh. In, in the introduction to the accounts, so on page 37 of your papers, uh, I think it's page, page 19 of the actual report, but page 37 of your papers, there, there's reference to the deficit on that contract and the reason for that. It's in fairly uh, summarised. Uh, form. There's been a bit more detail obviously come to the relevant service committee and as I said there'll be an investigation reporting back uh, in November. Joanne. Thanks. Just, just to echo Paul's comments there, as the external auditors we are comfortable with the disclosure that's included within the annual report and accounts and in our report on page 37 of the pack we do include narrative around the trunk road contract and from an accounting perspective, we are comfortable around that reversal of the 17-18 accrual and we're comfortable with what's reflected in the 18-19 account. So just to give that assurance. We have Councillor Hagman, then Young. Thank you, Chair, and thank you um, for your welcome to the committee. As one of the new members, obviously this is the first time that I've been 
here in this capacity looking at this. Um, one of the points that caught my eye was on page 24 in terms of the significant trading operations, and it mentions there that we have one trading operation built in maintenance. However, it makes reference to that the operation should break even over a three-year period, and the table below clearly shows that we haven't. I'm just looking for some clarity as to where we are in terms of of that that company, that trading arm, and how we move forward, and what the impact of this is. Yes, uh, that trading operation is no longer a, a trading operation. We are no longer doing the same level of trading that we had been when we were reporting those figures. In particular, as, as referenced below the table, we are, we're no longer uh, operating under the full uh, maintenance contract with the uh, Lobern Housing Association. So that has removed uh, that service from the statutory trading operations uh, criteria. However, obviously, we're trying to ensure, and we're ensuring, that going forward, that service operates on a, an even footing. It's now part of the Economy and Resources Service, and we've made sure that the budget's appropriately aligned for the new financial year. Councillor Young. Uh, thank you, Chair, and also thank you for your welcome to the committee. Uh, as part of the audited accounts on page 137, there's a list of four long-term debtors. Now, there seems to be a debt owed to the Council from Scottish Police of about six, just over six million in the previous year. They've repaid 153,000, and my sort of off-the-cuff calculations, it would take 53 years for them to clear that debt. Um, some of the Scottish Fire Rescue, the Scottish National Housing Trust, their debt remains as it was, and the other entities, some funds have been written off. I, I wondered if I could just have an explanation to that table, please. Um, certainly. The, the table for, for the debt is that it's um, several different areas. With regards to the Scottish Police Authority and the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service, um, when they were part of the council, um, when we were taking the capital borrowing at that period of time, we uh, in, in borrowed money when it was part of the council. However, subsequently it was transferred to Police Scotland, for example. There's outstanding loans that are part of the overall uh, uh, borrowing that we had. It wasn't like a specific loan just for the police or a specific loan just for the fire. It was part of overall uh, borrowing that we'd done. So the result, to pay back what they required to pay back over the course of life cycle of that borrowing, it was uh, the agreement was to um, pay that back over the same life cycle they would have if they were part of the council. So that's why the debt slowly reducing over a year is meeting the obligations to meet the, the loan charges over that period of time. Um, so, sorry. Oh, apologies, sorry. Um, the second part of the National Housing Trust was uh, to do with um, sustainable housing, affordable housing relating to March fields. There was an initial loan provided um, for the ability to build sustainable housing. That is a plan to get paid back um, over a couple of year period. Ideally, it's going to start getting paid back this year with hopefully the anticipation of getting paid back in full. But if not, over the next couple of years, it will be uh, completed. Remember that National Housing Trust initiative. It was quite a good one. But so, for what you're saying there, that's, but it looks like it it's not, hasn't even started to pay back yet. I think it was as, as the houses were bought, there was, a, it was, a, there was an allocation per house came back, almost like a developer's contribution. That, that's correct, Jess. The, the anticipation was it would be paid back um, rather than small stages, that would be paid back in, in significant lump sums to clear the, the debt. And just so, so, just so I, I understand, maybe uh, John's picked it up, but the, the police, so the 8 million, I've worked at any of its. No, it's. About 100, aye, about, 100, about 150 or 53k aye, per year. That's their portion of the whole 8 million pound odd debt. Is that what you're saying? That's their allocation? Then what's, what's the, what was the rest of the eight million pound for? You've, you've been, you've said it is okay. It's for, it's for wider borrowings. But what's the detail? That what's, I, I'm quite keen to hear the detail. The, the whole amount identified there against the Scottish Police Authority and the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service relate to the borrowing that Colin referred to. The amount, the 153, relates to the annual repayment in year in relation to that borrowing. As Councillor Young pointed out, it, uh, it's a relatively small amount. We'll maybe have a wee look at the detail of that. That is how much was received uh, last year, uh, but we'll have a look in why that's uh, such a small portion of that debt. 
So I just, it, it's, I'm, I'm not wanting to prolong this at all. So you would think that an N53K would be relative to the 50 odd years, is what John's saying. And that's, a, so, aye, so that's the, that's what you're saying. So obviously, so therefore the, the whole 8 million pound is, is their debt. Okay. It just seems odd that it's a small amount. Stephen, I think you want to come in. Comes for Thompson. Uh, thanks, Chair. Um, yeah, and it's sort of relating to Malcolm's question a wee bit because I think there's obviously a new member and thanks for the welcome. But uh, um, so I think there's the, there's the accounts in front of us and then there's the other council committees that would see the report and back through, say, for example, of risk. And I'm thinking about accrued risk <laughs> because clearly if something's got an explanatory note in the accounts, that's fine when you see the annual accounts. But in the course of the year, uh, through normal reporting cycles to other committees, you might not, I mean, as a number of members wouldn't have been aware that there was this accrued risk effectively, um, although it is written and qualified as a note with the accounts and the auditors might be happy with that as well from that perspective, because that's within their scope. But in terms of a council, um, and, and I don't want to sort of get into the realms of what any other report might be getting into as part of that investigation, but what policies or mechanisms do we have to be assured as members that we are aware that there are potential accrued income risks um, during the course of the year so that we can at least set aside or, or plan our budgets around them? Yeah. Obviously, we provide budget monitoring reports to service committees and to corporate committees on a quarterly basis through the year. Uh, however, this wasn't highlighted in those reports last year. It was only when it became apparent that the accrual was unlikely to be cleared that we were able to, to provide information back to members to, to highlight the extent of the concern at that stage, but that was something that wasn't adequately reflected in the monitoring. That was based on clear information from the service that it was fully anticipated that the accrual would be fully recovered. Uh, they were in negotiations with Transserve in relation to that, and but it was only once it became apparent that that was not going to be the case that we then reported that to members. But obviously we've had a look at the implications of that, how we monitor against the, the clearing of accruals in the financial year as part of our monitoring. If there's any issues of that nature, then obviously we'll try and ensure that they come through in those quarterly monitoring reports. Thanks, Chair. Yeah, so, I mean, that's obviously, that will unfold as, as is required with the work that's going on just now. But I think what draws it to the attention is maybe 2017-18, there was a figure of, I think it was about 1.5 <coughs> uh, accrued risk, if you like. And rather than that being addressed in the subsequent year, it actually doubled. Uh, so, so obviously there's, there's sort of flags that have gone along that one part of the system knows about that we as elected members didn't know about until obviously it's been reported um, to members now. But could that have been, you know, the question would be, could that have been dealt with better had we known about it earlier through another reporting method? Um, but I suppose that's it's academic now. Really. It is something that we're reflecting on as part of the, the review of what actually happened and how we can ensure that we minimise the risk of that in the future. Councillor Nicol. Thanks, Chair. To go back to the long-term debtors, if we could, um, there's roughly 10 million there, maybe 10 and a half million, uh, between the police authority and the fire and rescue. My, my take on this is that we, we as a local authority borrowed money to buy assets for the police authority, the, local, the Fries and Galloway Police and the Fries and Galloway Fire Service. And then when they became national, we still carry that debt. So technically the police cars and some of the police stations belong to us. So could we get them off the road so that the traffic will flow a bit more freely, please? I mean, is that my, that's my taking of the situation. Is that correct? At 100 and 50 grand a year, or whatever it is, John Young's quite right. It's going to take an awful long time to pay that back. And the fire authority haven't really made much of a start at all. So when's this likely to get paid back? I mean, we should, they should have given us that money. The government should have given us that money when they took over the assets. Because at the moment we own them and the assets will be depreciating. So they're getting worth less. And they'll get depreciating quicker than they're paying it back. There's something wrong here. This is not right. The, there is full repayment schedules for uh, the borrowings reflected in that table. As I uh, responded to Councillor Young earlier on, uh, it is surprising that it was such a small or relatively small amount last year. We'll look into the detail of that and we can certainly come back to members' details of when those borrowings will be fully repaid. 
it just, they should just write a check for whatever that sum is and get it squared off because it's it's not our responsibility. Councillor Campbell, then Maitland. Thank you, Chair, and thank you for the welcome as well and being on this committee. Uh, on the auditor's report on page 30, it's about the Common Good Fund. Uh, the, the council, well, the Common Good Fund uh, total assets is 8.822 million, which is quite a substantial sum. Uh, that's in land buildings and long-term investments, but it's the sentence that uh, the funds are held for the benefit of the residents, those former boroughs that must be used in the first in instance to maintain the assets of the common good. Now, uh, th there's really not much information just saying exactly how much we're spending to look after older buildings, probably buildings that have been laying empty for a number of years. You, you know, some of these buildings are getting into such a state now that when we do come to the position of either community asset transfer or selling them, and then the value is depreciated so much, I'm just wondering how much of this fund is actually being spent to maintain these buildings so that we can get maximum value. Yeah, in the accounts themselves, there's no detailed information on the common good expenditure. There is on page 163 financial statements, uh, but they just give you gross expenditure and gross income. They don't go into detail on that. Uh, there are reports coming forward to the individual common goods on the financial position at the moment. We recognise that reporting to the common good uh, committees has not been uh, particularly great in the recent period, and we recently had a session with the, the ward officers and ward managers to improve that, and that's starting to, to bear fruit. So that's the kind of thing you'd expect to see coming back to those committees and those reports. Councillor Maitland. Um, I'm going back to the accrual issue. Is the um, is the letter of representation, um, which we are to certify at 2.2, is that a standard letter? Is that the same letter that is written year on year? Um, because I suppose what I'm wondering is that, uh, was that letter wrong um, with respect to the accrual issue when, when, when it was presented last year to us? And how do we know what comfort we derive if we've got something wrong in the past? Um, <laughs> what comfort can we actually derive from this letter? So I think just to confirm in terms of the letter of representation, this is effectively our, our standard letter of representation where we are really looking for that uh, assurances over certain aspects of the financial statements and this gets signed along along with the accounts. Um, one of the things in here we obviously look at is estimates and judgments, but that is in the, obviously in the context of materiality in terms of overall materiality to the accounts. Um, and this really is just part of our audit process rather than anything else in terms of what we use the letter for. Hmm. Uh, I <laughs> don't know that I'm any clearer, actually. <laughs> Maybe, Paul, you could help us. I mean, I think the question was, given that there was an issue in the accounts at the end of 1718, what assurances can we take? Uh, obviously, when we were undertaking accruals, there are estimates to an extent. Uh, the trunk road accrual was very substantial uh, in comparison to other accruals at a corporate level. We did recognise that. Uh, the bad debt provision at the 17-18 year end made allowance for not being able to fully recover against that accrual. Unfortunately, while we initially thought that was a prudent level of provision that we set aside, it turned out not to be sufficient. Uh, as we have done previously, but I think particularly at this year end, we have thoroughly reviewed each of the accruals and, and ensured or tried to ensure sufficient backup or sufficient uh, assurance there that will be fully recovered made bad debt provisions again, uh, accordingly. Uh, so, no, they're subject to external audit, they're subject to internal audit review as well. Uh, I'm comfortable that we have made appropriate provisions for non-recovery of debts in our accounts. Obviously, as part of the monitoring, we'll review that and report any further issues to members as part of that monitoring process. Councillor Campbell, 
Councillor Driver. Thanks very much, yeah, but Councillor McKee's been waiting for quite a while, so if I don't mind, I'll give way to him and then come back, if that's okay. Fine, Jock, I didn't see. Councillor McKee. That's all right, don't worry about it. Uh, <coughs> on page 37, that's the Council page, learning lessons from third party. You mentioned DG1 and the North West Community Campus. Now, the DG1, co the co contract for DG1 was a design and build. My understanding was there were a number of, we were limited to the contractors that we could use. We used the design and build of uh, our notorious developer. What does we seem to be carrying the can here, and we, to me, we were restricted as to the people that we could use. Now, how can we carry the can for that? Especially when it was a design and build, and they told us quite frequently that what's going on has got nothing to do with you. We'll decide and we'll do what we think is appropriate. And we, the, you know, the, we all know the mess we got from that. So what, what can kind of comeback have we got from these sorts of contracts? We're for, forced to take certain, certain contractors. They make a mess of the job and we carry the can. So really, I'd like to know where, where we can go for there, how we can, we can't kind of really sort that out. But just on, on page 41, I'd like to raise the issue with the auditors. I under, I assume that they are responsible for the, the layout on these pages. Um, could the next time we do it, make sure that we can read the reserves and state sustainability chart? You've got a nice coloured chart there, but the letters underneath, and you've got a wee chart up at the top of the main chart that, to me, is impossible to read. So you could either get bigger print, magnifying glasses, or get your printer sorted out, please. I can sympathise that. I did struggle with that myself. I got, I got down about when I realised it was local authorities that it, that it was alluding to, but it wasn't. I didn't get the magnifying glass. That's what glass I thought as well, but I think no. it's actually but, all uh, to do with this authority. I suppose on the, I'll probably ask Paul to comment on, on, on your first question, and maybe ask Joanne if she's got any thoughts in regards to that as well. And it's okay, my understanding it. is it's okay. What, what could the council have done to better manage that particular type of contract? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh. Yeah, a couple of things. Uh, I think first of all, on those two particular projects, uh, DG1 and Northwest, you referred to. Obviously, there was specific processes undertaken there where we actually achieved significant recoveries from both the, the contractors. Uh, but I appreciate that it's still left the council with significant issues to address itself. Uh, the external auditors have actually, in their action plan recommendations, uh, following their uh, review have identified that learning lessons with supplier management is an action for the council going forward. We've all, already obviously been taking those actions and they're reflected in the management response there. Uh, those actions include the, the establishment of the programme management office to try and ensure that our approach to uh, planning and delivering and monitoring on the delivery of projects is more robust going forward. So that's something that we've already put in place. So lessons have been learned and we have actually managed to secure some recoveries in relation to those uh, two projects that you mentioned there. What can we assume that lessons have been learned by those who identify contractors who may be suitable to do such contracts? One thing I can say is that in terms of the approach to procurement of major capital projects, the, the Scottish Government's new uh, scheme for delivery of uh, major school investments going forward are significantly revised from the scheme that those projects were actually, or the North West project was actually undertaken under. It gives councils more freedom in terms of the procurement approach. Anything you can add to that, uh, Joanne? I'm just wondering about assurance, reassurances for the member uh, in regards to contracts. I know Paul gave quite a full answer, but from an external auditor's point of view. Yeah, from an external auditor's point of view, just really to echo what Paul said there around the council learning those lessons. We've had a number of conversations and we can see a number of actions the council are putting in place reflecting on those lessons, in particular the really positive development around the PMO, and that's something we'll look at as part of our 1920 audit, just in terms of the establishment of that and how that works in terms of overseeing key projects. 
So we can see certain actions during the year which the council are taking forward actively and learning the lessons that are applicable to the council. So I think we can give that assurance as external auditors that you are looking at that. Thanks, Joanne. Councillor Driver. Yeah, thanks. Thanks very much, Chair. And again, uh, appreciate the welcome back to audit risk and uh, scrutiny um, from several years ago. Um, it's just coming back to the point that Councillor Campbell made on the common good funds. Dumfries and Galloway administer the common good funds of the former boroughs on page 30. There's, there appears to be some towns missing. Langham, for instance, the Kiln Green and the Town Hall is part of the common good. There are other areas in Dumfries and Galloway, Sankar, I'm sure it was in there anyway. Um, no, it isn't it? Sankar has got some common good issues and that appears to be missing now for obviously people reading this account from those areas. They will say, where is our common good assets? So I just want to make sure for clarity that that's been taken into consideration. What page again, Archie, did you say? 30. Right, but, no, that's right. That's right. I see that. There was a table where I've seen it in the, in the asset values. I picked up and I didn't pick up it in that particular point. I did think Langham was one that... So it is a common good, but it hasn't got a common good committee. I would, I would imagine that that's the, the, the difference. But I mean, I think Archie's absolutely right. There's all common goods haven't been identified. I think in Langham's particular case, it, I think the town hall would actually be an asset, wouldn't it? So that would be one of the assets. Maybe you could explain better, Archie. The, 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 the two assets that the, the Langham have got is the Town Hall and the Kiln Green Car Park. And the Kiln Green Car Park, obviously, get the, the, the council gets funding from the fair that happens after the common riding and things like that. So there is a common good asset within the Langham Town. Answer, Paul. I'm afraid I can't uh, provide any information in relation to Langham Common Good, but we'll look into that and get back to members. Are you comfortable with that, Archie? You comfortable with that? So we'll get information in regards to that, that particular common good and others, if there's any, uh, I would imagine. Might be something that the area committee wants to look at, but maybe Councillor Thompson. Yeah, if it's, if it's helpful, I mean, I think there's, I think we have uh, recognised common good funds, but that's not necessarily where all the common goods are, if you like. Um, it's just that some of the common good funds are, of, are substantial enough to have a fund that can be administered and decisions can be taken about it. Others might be in the case of Langham Town Hall or Moffat, where there's a particular object or, or, or asset somewhere, but it would never be such that it would be a common good fund in and of itself. It, it might be considered, normally I think the practice is to consider those things as and when they arise unusually at area committee. Um, but I don't know if that's, if there's a wee piece of detail needs to be added to the report. Okay, it's a point, I mean, I think you're absolutely right in your description to the way it currently works. But I think if it, it, the only difference is, or the information that's been added, uh, from Archie that I've picked up in there, there is actually an income stream to the Langham Common Good, which I wasn't aware of, so therefore you think it would create the fund that meets the same criteria as, say, Annan, Lockerbie and Lockerbie and so on and so forth. So it may be something with that as an action even. Uh, we'll pick up on that and we'll look into we'll, we'll get the information back. Mm -hmm. Any other members got any other points? Councillor McKee. Sorry, Chair, just a quickie. It's on page 47. It's regarding with the annual funding support for Waste PFI. We've lost 1.424 million because a company walked away from it and we've had to take on the waste, waste management for Dumfries and Galloway. Is that, was there any justifiable re well, I suppose it'll never be justifiable, yes, but a justifiable reason given for that funding to be withdrawn? That annual funding from the Scottish Government was identified as being specifically to support the waste PFI project. So the, the kind of position there is that that automatically comes to an end at the end of the contract period. We did negotiate with the Scottish Government, did uh, seek some uh, comeback in relation to that, and this is reflected in the, the same table you referred to there. We managed to secure £6 million of one-off non-recurring funding as compensation for the loss of that amount. I've got any other points. I'll pick up on one small point myself, and it's probably for you, Joanne, I think. So on page 43 of the report, 25 of your own report, it just it talks in general terms about the governance committee structures uh, and arrangements and the, the audit and the level of risk. So the point I'll pick up in here, I think, is uh, opportunities to utilise internal audit to provide more strategic value, adding services, including support and risk assessment of proposed service redesign through transformation. 
I thought that was quite relative to what we're going through, obviously. And you pick up elsewhere within there saying that, the, well, my interpretation is they do look at financial, uh, the financial processes, probably, and if you look at the internal uh, audit reports, quite minutiae, but for what I can pick up on the action points you're saying is that actually they need to be looking at the more wider strategic objectives to be to have a, a higher level of performance. Would I be correct in saying that? Yes. I think from our perspective, over a number of years, your internal audit team have focused quite heavily on the financial controls of the council in something like the region of 280 to 300 days of the year focused on financial systems and controls. Generally, generally, your controls are well designed and operate effectively, and those reports from internal audit raise very few areas of risk for consideration. So what we highlighted in prior year, and again this year, is I think there is an opportunity to take a step back and relook at the internal audit plan and make sure internal audit are focused on helping the Council through some of the strategic change, the transformation the Council is facing. Um, potentially, internal audit might be an area that they're able to help identify where savings can come from or think about cultural aspects of certain parts of the council. So I think there is an opportunity to, to take that step back now and look at how internal audit is best used to support the council going forward, given the changing landscape. I think just a quick comment before Councillor Maitland comes in. I think she's got some uh, points to raise on, on the same point. One of the things that I think as a committee we're looking to do, if you look behind our first, the front of our first page, it's our delegations, it's a item of business that we didn't cover. But I, I think one of the things we're looking to do is, because of that specific thing, the committee itself obviously uh, has to make sure that it's performing at the right level in the proper way and looking at the right things. So I did a track back myself, looking at the type of subject matters we were looking at, agenda items, and, and I thought it was quite a few of those delegations we were absolutely missing out on. So we looked at an annual report to say, okay, have we made, have we made sure that we've covered all bases? And I think that's something... For future committees, uh, it's kind of aligns to what it kind of came from your your own assessment of, of, of these uh, internal audits, in particular, and the wider strategic ob uh, objectives we could be looking at. Jane, you're wanting in there. Um, no, just to to support you, Chairman, um, uh, and and to say that I absolutely endorse the use um, of our resource, which is slender, slender, but nevertheless should be used on a wider basis. I think a strategic basis, much much more useful. Um, and um, you might remember, Chairman, that actually the committee has started gently to pick away at this by adding extra days onto the internal audit plan with respect to um, doing some work with health and social care. So um, we've begun that process, and I certainly absolutely endorse your proposal that this should con continue. Thank you. Thanks very much. When you look at the internal audits, just bring in in a second, okay. the internal aud audits were in a different report. It, I mean, when, I, when I read through them, uh, they were quite repetitive, which is which is absolutely fine. You, you would expect that, but an automated software package, you think, would just take address ninety nine percent of that rather than get in and have it physically do it. It seemed more like a, a something we've always done, so we'll always do it. But obviously, transformation will drive change. Councillor Hagman. Thank you, Chair, for letting me come in. Um, obviously, there's a lot of information in here, and one of the points that I did pick up on page ninety five when we were looking at ensuring, well, under the title of ensuring effective management of change and transformation, was on page 95, one of the bullet points actually suggested that to support transformation, we need a fit and healthy and engaged workforce. So it was just really a question to ask, how do we as a committee ensure that we're, our staff are being looked at? Because obviously that is a huge risk we're asking our staff to deliver more and more on less. So, I mean, I'm, I'm aware that the, the minute of the previous meeting had lots of items in there. I mean, is there an opportunity in the future for us to bring that forward? It's, it's just more an open question, really, on something that's been highlighted in this report. Well, thanks very much. I would imagine it sits within our risk register, so there's certainly an opportunity for, for the committee to uh, look at that and address that. But, would, Paul, have you got anything to add in regards to that? No. No, I would, I, I would imagine that's absolutely where it sits. A risk register, there'll be a number of risks around about a workforce, make sure it's fit for the purpose, who's treating them in the right way. But we can look at that even as, as an item as it comes forward. And, and uh, scrutiny reviews, actually, it's one a mechanism that I think valuable to this committee. It's away from the risk, but we can actually get a level of scrutiny uh, and uh, delve right into the, the, the operational side, so the workforce, all aspects of that, and come up with our, our own evaluation. At that point in time, they have no other speaker. Oh, Councillor Nicholl, then we'll call it a day Just after that. on that point, that 
we need to be getting out to the general public that we have got less assets in human terms, we've got less money, and we cannot supply the services that we've been supplying over the past twenty years with the assets that we've got available to us at the moment. And we need to be getting that message out there because the general public are not, they still expect everything they've had in the past and it cannot be done. It's a physical impossibility. And when he mentioned it at community councils, the mouths just fall open. And because one of the things they're not uh, aware of is the amount of money that has been taken out of the budget and the amount of savings that as a council we've had to make. So as a council, we need to be getting that message out there. I'm glad to see that Paul's nod his head. Um, but that, 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 something we're not good at, and we need to be getting better at it quickly. Okay, transformation does drive change, and I would imagine as members will be up front with our, with our constituents in regards to the, the true reality. Councillor Howie, Ian, it's, I'll just give you the oppor opportunity to come in if you want, but I outlined at the beginning of the meeting, it's a, it's a three agenda item we've covered, we're on the third now, under the circumstances that you will be made aware of, I would imagine, when you came in. So, right, okay, right, okay, so for that, this will be the last thing. So just, if you've got anything to add or ask or anything, to give you the opportunity. So everybody's had an opportunity, I think, and so for the sake, just a reminder, we will come back to revisit this, the rest of the business in short course, probably over the next two to four weeks, if that's possible, uh, subject to diary commitments, so on and so forth. Uh, what we're looking at today, after quite a number of questions, uh, which is quite good to receive the questions without the presentation. For me, that's that, that's good to understand that everybody has actually read the reports and understand. So 2.1, I think, would have changed. We'll change 2.1 to 2.2, which would then read approve the letter of representation to be certified by the Head of uh, Finance and Procurement appended to the report as per Appendix 2. Mm -hmm. yep. I thought it was, oh, sorry, I thought like as in presentation. Okay, we have received it as part of the, the, of the report, actually, but as normally I would refer that to be in a, a presentation. So, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll refer that back because we've received it. It's contained within our papers. I'll take that advice kindly. So 2.1 is the same, receive the external uh, audits report. As per appendix one, I've covered 2.2. 2.3 is to approve the audited uh, accounts, which will be certified by the head of uh, finance, procurement, and Grant Thornton after this meeting that's detailed. Uh, appendix 3, yep, we're okay with that, yep, absolutely. And 2.4 is to note that the certified accounts will be made available to all members before 31st October 2019 uh, when they will uh, be made available on the Council's website as detailed at paragraph 3.8. Councillor Driver. So you're just on that one, can we have that, that little action on there about regards to the, the common goods? Because there will be people who will read this and say, where are our common goods in here? So it's, it's just a, an overview of the common goods and the other, uh, you know, Langham, for instance, is, is actually in there. Okay, can we get it? Carly, that was an action. So, I mean, as an action, I would have, so it, it'd be, don't certify the accounts will be, and ultimately at the end of that with amended, as per what council drivers just outlined, which is the common goods that need to be added. Langham was specifically mentioned. Okay. Uh, I will just cover one small thing, more as an action, as information to the committee. So. What I'm going to ask, so item number six is redundant at this moment in time, number seven is redundant. Item number eight, scrutiny reviews. If you refer back to the minute, which we haven't looked at, uh, I'll ask you to do that. This is something I want you to do opposite away from the committee. And if you go to page nine, page nine at, at number six, the decision, it's agreed. And from 6.1.1 uh, through to 6.1.16, there's a, a number of different ideas that came up through a, a workshop type out was a committee that we had in regards to scrutiny reviews. So the way I'm going to work the next meeting, so we're looking at doing scrutiny reviews, we should have really done that today. So rather than getting to that, I've said to Councillor Maitland as Vice Chair, she's got to come up with, with one. It's either in here or it can be completely separate. I'll, I'll come up with one. Yourselves as a grouping, please come up with one. And whatever you say, whatever uh, scrutiny review you'd like, whether it's contained in here or not, we'll take that. We'll take a, uh, just as a representation, we don't need to you know, look for that to come through committee. And same from the grouping over here. We'll just, I thought it was a way, so we'll have four scrutiny reviews in which to, to go forward. You can debate that away and you can inform uh, through our clerk, I think in particular, which is clear, uh, or Nick or Paul for that matter, but what, what actual items of scrutiny review you'd like to be heard. So that just is, a, just is a piece of information. That's what the Chair and I decided before we came in. Okay, if no other comment on business, thanks very much for your time. Very much appreciated under the circumstances. Thank you. Okay.